George, if you will. I solemnly swear that I am up to no good. Hello. <clears throat> Excuse me. Hello. Welcome to another episode of the Built Forms of Cinema, where we examine the relationship between architecture and its role in film production. Almost every kid who grew up in the 90s will remember these two things. One, the unavoidable demise of your Tamagotchi, and two, the excruciating patience required in awaiting the fate of the boy who lived. It's Harry Potter. Harry Potter. Harry Potter. Harry Potter. Harry Potter. Can't be Harry Potter. And who are you? Oh, sorry, sir. I'm Harry, sir. Harry Potter. Good Lord. Are you really? Today, I want to take a look at the work of the man most responsible for bringing the magical world of Harry Potter to life on the big screen. It's not real, the ceiling. It's just bewitched to look like the night sky. I read about it in Hogwarts, a history. That's this guy right here. Stuart Craig, the British production designer whose awards and accolades include Oscars for Gandhi in 1982, Dangerous Liaisons in 1988, and The English Patient in 1996. Together with set decorator and longtime collaborating partner Stephanie McMillan, designed the sets for all eight of the Harry Potter films. To me, one of the most exciting aspects of the aesthetics in the Harry Potter franchise was seeing the way Craig mixed and matched different elements of different architectural styles to help construct the film's narrative. Oh, and keep an eye on the staircases. They like to change. From the fan vaults of Gothic, to the decorated gables of Tudor, to the brick-clad walls of Victorian that makes everything feel almost very Oliver Twist-esque, Craig manages to weave them into various aspects of his production design. And when these aesthetic elements are mixed together, the result is even more profound. Stepper, we've got fainting fancies! Those bleed new guard are just in time for school! Duking pastels! Take this scene here, where Harry and Co.'s English prep tutorial style is mixed with the steam locomotives of the 50s in order to reach a castle from the Middle Ages. The juxtaposition creates a timeless feel that could only be the byproduct of magic, or really good art direction. This, of course, is by no means a new methodology. We see that in science fiction films like Ridley Scott's 1982 Blade Runner, where ultra-modern megablocks is merged with historical elements to create a futuristic vision of Los Angeles. This helps inject personality into your physical environment. The foreboding forms and straight lines of the Tyrell Corporation implies lack of sympathy and disconnect from the real world, and is used to contrast the use of many of the city's historical landmarks, such as the Bradbury Building. Home to some of the more colorful characters, its ornamentation and detail symbolizes outdated humanity and sympathy. And that's what Craig and Macmillan do most effectively for the world of Harry Potter, assigning personality to every piece of production design to either reflect the motives of the inhabitants or dictate mood and atmosphere. Lovely spot. <laughs> the imposing nature of gothic elements commands respect and authority as an institution. The Dickens-esque orphanage with its Georgian influences create feelings of apprehension, while the Victorian nature of the Ministry of Magic reflects hierarchy. Its hint of Art Nouveau also suggests a casual decadence and corruption, possibly foreshadowing the coming era of fascist takeover that would have impressed Mussolini himself. Actually, the changing aesthetics of the Ministry of Magic, in my opinion, is one of the most effective and powerful visual cues in the entire film series. We first see Harry visit the Ministry in the Order of Phoenix, where its Victorian architecture creates a sense of awe and grandeur. An idealistic statue of unity ironically reflects the fractures in the Wizarding World. During Part 1 of the Deathly Hallows, Harry returns with Ron and Hermione to infiltrate the Ministry to steal the locket back from Dolores Umbridge. Albert, aren't you getting out? Here, the statue is now replaced by something a little more stallion-esque. Are those muggles in their rightful place? Visually, this was immediately effective in conveying the changes that has afflicted the Ministry. And for the older audiences, right away this creates an emotional resonance. Combined with the Snatcher's red bands and posters of Harry as indesirable number one, this reference to fascist tactics is able to drive the film's narrative and atmosphere more directly than any forms of dialogue or backstory. And this is an example of what really good art direction should be able to do. Oh my god, what am I gonna do? My wife's all alone downstairs. Ron, you don't have a wife. To truly appreciate the production design of the Harry Potter series, perhaps it's best to compare it with a film franchise that rivals it in terms of production budget, cinematic scale, and popularity. The Marvel Cinematic Universe. The Avengers. It's 
That's what we call ourselves. Sort of like a team. Earth's mightiest heroes type thing. To me, these movies from Marvel Studio, in creating a coherent storyline and universe from its comic book counterparts, is an unprecedented achievement in terms of film production and film marketing in our generation. But to achieve this, the films had to create a uniform aesthetic across the board, from its bright color schemes to its set design, and even film posters in which the hero always stands in the middle looking off-center, unifying the worlds of Iron Man, Thor, Captain America, and even Ant-Man. While I understand this is done so that the franchise could end in an inevitable orgy of superheroes, and scenes like this wouldn't look so out of place and weird, I think a lot of ground is lost in visual opportunities. Let's take a look at the world of Harry Potter again where we can easily differentiate between government, school, or home, privilege, eccentricity, or institution. The built environment is more than just background, it serves as a part of the narrative. But when we look at the world of the Marvel Universe, everything has the same clean, high-tech, modern, glossy look to it. Literally, everything looks the exact same. It's actually quite difficult to differentiate between the residents of Iron Man or one that would house S.H.I.E.L.D a universe under the reign of Thor, or a world occupied by the Guardians of the Galaxy. It's a slippery slope because what the audience really can't tell the difference anymore, they serve very little narrative purpose except for being blown up. Whether it's Tony's house, Asgard, a helicarrier, or three helicarriers. Seriously, if you look back at the locations of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, every place these guys occupy gets obliterated. What are we, a team? No, 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 we're a chemical mixture that makes chaos. We're we're a time bomb. And that's what I think is quite special about the design of the world of Harry Potter. Because a lot of big budget action adventure films coming out of Hollywood actually does little to enhance the cinematic experience. Bigger, badder, and trying to create the largest set pieces to blow up shouldn't be the ultimate competition in production design. Instead, how can production design be effectively utilized to complement a medium that is very much a visual one? Because most of the time, getting the audience attention doesn't necessarily mean blowing something up. Well, half the time.